Hi, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. I'm going to give everybody a minute or two to get in. And we just want to thank everyone so much for being here. Uh, and we're really excited. Um, Dr. Barry Kravis is an expert on, on seizures and tremors and runs one of our clinics that's in the Access and Clinical and Research Consortium. So hi there, I'm Carol Marshart. I'm the Executive Director of Access, and I wanna thank you all so much for being here and, and welcome to our webinar. The mission of Access is to help individuals with one or more extra X and or Y chromosomes and their families to live fuller, more productive lives. We do this by helping with support, education, research, and treatment. Access One's a helpline. Anybody can call the phone number listed here and leave a message or email us, helpline at genetic.org. Trained volunteers will respond to people's questions. We can pair callers often with someone in the same situation. So for example, someone with a prenatal diagnosis can talk to somebody else who got a prenatal diagnosis or the specific condition. Our volunteers listen, provide empathy, and help direct you to resources. Access runs a number of support groups. Many of you are probably already in our Facebook support groups. It is a great way to reach out to others 24 seven. And especially in this time um, of social distancing and COVID, we really like being able to uh, talk to each other on Facebook. So you can go to our website, genetic.org and look at the support groups for a full listing of all the support groups. We'll also be running uh, in-person support groups. Hopefully we'll be able to get back to those soon. We also, we want you to know that right now we have a continuing medical education course for doctors. It's about Klinefelter syndrome in adults. It is right on our website. There's a panel also on our front side they can click to. We're really excited about this because you can recommend your doctor take it. Your doctor can get three hours of credits absolutely at no charge to them. We wanna make sure you know that we have a library on our website that contains all kinds of research articles, especially many of the ones that will be mentioned here today. It also has our news and newsletters. Dr. Barry Kravis is one of the uh, individuals of uh, the clinical researchers and doctors that make up the Access Clinical and Research Consortium. We have clinics throughout the US and we also now have some outside of the US. So visit our website to get all of the information. This webinar, along with many other webinars and presentations from our conferences, is on our Access YouTube channel. There's a link to that right on the homepage of our website. It's a fantastic way for you to get more information about a variety of topics that you would find very interesting. We're really thrilled at Access that what we'd love to do is work with the researchers. So the Access community, which is all of us, we work with the physicians and researchers Many of them are doing clinical studies. When they do those studies, they come to us and ask us to promote the studies so we can let you know about it. Individuals from our community participate in those studies. Then they write scientific papers, which they come back and present back at our conference or our webinar. So we love that we're able to bring this full circle. And that's what we're doing here today. So again, we wanted to uh, bring on Dr. Elizabeth Berry Kravitz, and we are thrilled to have her come and talk to us about seizures. I'm going to put a link in the chat to this consensus document that she wrote for us, and that has all kinds of information. You can download that and review it um, after the webinar is over. So thank you, Dr. Berry Kravitz. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so I am just going to share my screen here and I'm going to do a general, you know, presentation on seizures as well as kind of uh, show information on what we know about seizures and X and Y variations. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to try to get this from the beginning. Okay. Um, all right. Can people see? I'm going to assume that this is showing okay if nobody tells me. 
It looks good. Looks good. Okay. Um, all right. So um, this is kind of an update from a, a talk I gave now about five years ago at a um, at one of the access meetings. And basically, what I'm going to do is go over what seizures are and what kind of seizures there can be, and then talk a little bit about what seizures we see in X and Y variation, and then how to treat seizures. Um, and also, um, in this slideshow, I have stuff on tremor. And if we have time and people are interested, I can certainly talk about that as well. Um, so what is a seizure and what is epilepsy? Well, a seizure is a single event characterized by an abrupt change of behavior and discharges that are going on in the brain somewhere. Um, and it can either be as a primary abnormal electrical excitability in an otherwise normal brain or secondary to some other thing that's going on in the brain, like an infection or a tumor. Um, so seizures are paroxysmal. They come and go in a burst and they're not always there. Um, epilepsy is recurrent seizures. If you have one seizure, you've had a seizure. If you have two or more seizures, you have epilepsy. Although certainly epilepsy can um, resolve and, and people don't always have it throughout life. Um, and the primary problem is these abnormal electrical discharges from neurons. Um, so causes of seizures include like an acute response to a new condition, being hit on the head, pretty hard, infections, stroke, um, taking something toxic, a tumor, a metabolic problem in the body. They can be a delayed effect. Sometimes if you have a head injury, you may not have seizures right away, but you may have it a month down the line, or you may have seizures later after having a brain infection or having surgery. Um, and sometimes there's kind of a permanent brain scar from an old disease, um, like an like a insult from um, not having enough oxygen at birth or from a stroke or an infection or something, and then that can serve as a seizure focus. But the most common type of seizures that we see are people who just have a genetic hyperexcitability of the brain. Um, in other words, the brain is just more prone to having seizures than, than a typical person's would be. And these are called idiopathic, and we're gradually figuring out the causes of some of these idiopathic seizure problems. But um, essentially, there's nothing else obvious that the patient has, no other diagnosis. Um, so it can also be occur you know, in other conditions that are like an intellectual disorder, a genetic syndrome, a neurodegenerative disease, some kind of disease of the brain. Um, or a genetic condition that impacts the brain that causes the seizures to occur in addition to the other manifestations of that condition. And so in people with extra sex chromosomes, seizures occur from a genetic propensity that's based on the disorder, but they can also have an acute cause. So if you have somebody, say with Klinefelter syndrome who has a new onset seizure, it, the, that person could have an infection or something else. And you, the, you, the onus is always there to prove that you're not dealing with some other problem on top of the client filters or other um, sex chromosome aneuploidy. Um, so this is the way we classified seizures for many years. It's called the International Classification of Epileptic Seizures. Many of you will have heard seizures classified into partial or generalized. Partial means the seizure comes from one part of the brain. Generalized means the seizure activity happens abruptly in the entire brain. And then partial seizures were always divided into simple and complex, where simple was a seizure where you didn't, you just maybe had a twitching of your arm or something and you don't lose consciousness, whereas complex means that there is an impairment of consciousness. And then there's a list of different types of, of generalized seizures um, that include the, the kind of generalized tonic-clonic seizure that we all think of as a classic grand mal seizure, but also seizures with jerks like myoclonic, seizures with stiffening like tonic, seizures where you suddenly drop, which are atonic, and seizures where you just stare, which are absence. So, but just to make things fun, in 2017, the whole seizure classification was changed. So it's really talking about the same kinds of seizures, but um, the terminology is different. And the idea was to make it more understandable. Um, so those old partial seizures are now called focal onset seizures, and the generalized ones are generalized onset, but it means the same thing. And then they divided simple is aware, meaning you're awake during the seizure, and um, complex is now impaired awareness. Um, and then they divide it between motor onset, where you have some twitching or something at the beginning of the seizure, to a non-motor onset, where you might do something else or stare off. Um, and then the generalized seizures are pretty much the same 
kinds of, of list of things. And then they have a new classification for unknown onset, which happens in some patients where we just can't figure out what type of seizures exactly they have. Um, so the, the old partial seizures, which are now focal seizures, um, they mean the same thing, um, can happen where the person is awake and they just have a manifestation, like they see something weird or their arm twitches or they have a funny sensory phenomenon or something like that, but they're fully awake and they're aware in the new classification. A complex partial seizure is where you have an alteration of consciousness and you may not be completely out, but you're not like normally alert. And then localized movements, you can have repetitive or odd movements like lip smacking. Some patients will start with a simple seizure at the beginning or an aware seizure at the beginning, and then they'll kind of lose consciousness or, or have impaired consciousness. Um, and then sometimes there's secondary generalization, meaning you start with a focal seizure and then the seizure becomes a full um, big generalized uh, motor seizure. So um, <clears throat> complex partial seizures or, or focal seizures, uh, often they don't have a motor onset. So they're the non-motor onset kind in the new classification. They, use, they, they can come from the temporal lobe. They're, they're, in the past, they were called temporal lobe seizures or psychomotor seizures. Um, there's, you know, again, an impaired consciousness. This is representative, this represents 20% of childhood epilepsy and tends to happen more in older children than in younger children. Um, and the reason that it's important to distinguish this type is that if it's a seizure coming from one part of the brain, there can be a focal area of the brain, you know, that we need to rule out a problem in, such as an abnormal blood vessel or a tumor or something else, a localized infection, something else that we would need to treat. Um, partial seizures can also be part of a genetic syndrome without having any specific area of the brain be abnormal. And in some cases, surgery can be a treatment in severe cases. Generalized seizures involve the whole brain all at once. Um, and so the non-motor kind are the absence. The classic absence is the person that stares off and then kind of fluttered, flutters the eyes. And this used to be called, quote, petite mal seizures. Um, motor seizures include sudden myoclonic jerks where you just sort of jerk your whole body in a cluster. Um, and um, clonic seizures are jerking, tonic seizures are stiffening, and tonic-clonic are stiffening followed by jerking, the old classic grand mal seizure. But tonic, tonic-clonic, clonic, and tonic seizures are all basically the same thing. It's just kind of how the seizure manifested in a person. And then atonic seizures are seizures where someone suddenly falls, or if they, they may not fall all the way to the ground, they may just, for instance, lose tone and their head may drop. Um, the generalized tonic clonic seizure is the most common type of seizure in urgent care um, because patients, you know, can have respiratory changes um, when they're in the middle of a generalized tonic clonic seizure and they're not in control of their body. Um, so the cause of the seizure is found in about 25% of these types of seizures and about 5 to 15% have a specific genetic factor that is causing the seizure and about 30 to 50% have a re have another recurrence after a first seizure. So there are many people that that you know by extension there's you know 50 to 70 percent of people that will have one of these seizures and will not ever have another one. Um, this type of seizure, there's loss of consciousness, there's stiffening or clonic jerking of the extremities. There can often be a loud cry right at the start of the seizure. The eyes typically roll up. There can be noisy breathing. The jaw may look clenched and there may be secretions that kind of pool in the mouth. Um, people use can you have be incontinent of urine or stool during the seizures. And then after the seizure, typically the patient is drowsy for some period of time that can vary a lot. Um, sometimes it can, the, these seizures can start local, focally, like one, a single arm twitching, but you may not have seen that. You may not know the patient is having the seizure until they're having twitching everywhere. Um, status epilepticus is defined as a single or repetitive seizure that goes on for 30 minutes without the person waking up. Um, their body changes like a poor breathing effort, increased blood pressure, pulse and temperature, and then there are different blood measures like lactate and prolactin and white blood cells that go up as a response to stress. 
Um, brain injury does usually not occur from a seizure unless the seizure is provoked by something that's already causing a problem in the brain itself, like encephalitis. Just having a 30 minute seizure does not cause brain damage. And there was a very nice study they did in England where they looked at people with febrile seizures and they compared kids that had uh, young kids that had a febrile seizure that lasted more than 30 minutes with typically developing kids that never had a seizure. And it turned out that at age 10, there was absolutely no difference between these two groups in terms of their intellectual or learning ability. So it seems that having the seizure itself, as long as nothing else is going on, is not, even if it's a long one, is not really a problem in terms of causing brain damage. Um, this is just some EEGs. This is what a generalized seizure looks like, where you see these spiky things going up in the EEG, and they just persist throughout the entire um, EEG. And then this is a partial seizure where you can see the spiky things are only in some of these leads, meaning this is kind of um, on the right side over the, over the top and side of the head, and that's where that seizure is coming from. Um, but you don't see those discharges all over the brain, so that seizure is going on just in one part of the brain. Um, febrile seizures is a special case. These are quite common in the population. Two to 5% of children are gonna have febrile seizures at some time or another. They're typically generalized. Um, they usually follow a viral illness, but really can follow any febrile illness. And there's a genetic predisposition to these such that having a family history of febrile seizures means that you could be more likely to have febrile seizures. And certainly um, patients with X and Y variations as well as any other genetic condition can have febrile seizures just because the entire population can have febrile seizures. Um, the criteria for diagnosis of a simple febrile seizure is that the person has to be between six months and five years. They have to have a fever. Um, the seizure typically lasts less than 15 minutes, although some of the more complicated ones last a little bit longer. Um, there's no evidence of, a, of another disease or a central nervous system process going on. There are no signs that would suggest that the seizure is on one side or the other, like no focal signs. And if you do an EEG after the seizure, in between you know, any seizures, you would have a normal EEG. Um, Febrile seizures are usually benign and they, they resolve by age six usually. Um, some two to 4% of, of kids that have febrile seizures will eventually develop non-febrile seizures, in other words, epilepsy later in life. And the more febrile seizures a child has, the more likely they will develop epilepsy. Um, 20 to 40% of kids with one febrile seizure will have a recurrent febrile seizure sometime else when they have a fever. That doesn't mean they're going to have epilepsy later on as long as they're still in the age range for febrile seizures. Um, the complexity of the seizure is an important predictor of recurrence. In other words, if there's a long seizure or if there's some focal elements to it, the patient may be more likely to have recurrences. And we don't treat this with anticonvulsants unless it goes on for a very long time. We just treat, to, to try to prevent this, we use um, Tylenol and ibuprofen and treat infections that may be present. And sometimes if the seizure is lasting a while, you may use um, diastat, which is a rectal um, form of Valium or other treatments to stop it. Um, so when we're evaluating seizures in clinic, what do we want to know from the family? We want to know a detailed moment-by-moment -moment history of the event, like how did it start? What kind of activity was the was the patient doing when it happened, the body position, what progressed, like what happened first and then next and then, and then after that. And this can be important to even distinguish whether an event is a seizure or whether it's something else like fainting. Um, the length of the seizure, whether the patient lost um, bowel or bladder function, whether they bit their tongue, and whether they had something weird that happened before the seizure, like an unusual visual auditory or, or some unusual smell. Um, we usually, you know, try to understand whether the seizure might be associated with a low glucose. So when did they eat last? What other provocative factors might there be? Was there a fever? Um, and was the patient's development normal? Now in, a, in an X and Y variation, the development may be related to the condition itself, but we want to know, you know, how the patient is functioning. Um, and whether there was any head trauma and past central nervous system illnesses, whether there's a family history of seizures. Um, and then on the exam, we look for certain features that might suggest that there's a different condition going on. Um, <clears throat> there are lots of things that look like seizures that aren't seizures. There's something called shuddering that babies do that looks exactly like what I said. It looks like shuddering, um, like look like the baby's having a brief 
shiver basically. And um, that is not a seizure and it's not really associated with any kind of long-term problems, except it seems to occur in, in babies that have more family history of tremor than, um, than other families. Um, neonatal apnea, sometimes babies that are born, you know, are in the early infancy period, just their breathing isn't regulated right. So they just sometimes have periods of spells when they don't breathe well. And that is, can sometimes be interpreted as a seizure. Um, apneic seizures of babies are actually pretty uncommon, but um, we always evaluate it for that. Um, benign nocturnal myoclonus. This is one of the really common things that people come in thinking they may be having a seizure because the patient is having these twitching movements at night, particularly while they fall asleep or while they're in light sleep. And um, it's just like there's a jerk on one side of the body and then there's a jerk on the other side of the body. And this is, this is benign. This is a normal sleep phenomenon. It's just some people have a very prominent version of it. Um, so it, it's, it's worrying in terms of whether it might be a seizure or not. Night terrors are often evaluated for seizures. Some migraines have um, particular focal findings and unusual sensory phenomena that, make, um, that may look like a seizure. Um, panic attacks are sometimes misinterpreted as a seizure. And then probably one of the more common things we see in neurology clinic is people referred for um, a spell of losing consciousness. And was that a seizure or was it fainting? And so it's, it can be a little tricky to figure out because a fainting episode, you know, you're actually not getting enough oxygen to the brain. So in a fainting episode, you may actually have a brief convulsion right at the end of the, of the spell. Um, and so what's important is the order of events. If the person faints first and then they have a brief convulsion later, then that's, that's probably a fainting episode with a seizure due to fainting. Um, and and um, passing out can come from breath holding spells, particularly kids less than six that start, they start to cry and then they pull that first breath in and then they don't breathe. Um, and uh, sometimes hyperventilation can cause fainting. And then there are patients with what we call neurocardiogenic syncope or basically fainting because they're, they don't regulate their their blood pressure well when they change positions and then when they stand up, they can faint. And then there's a heart condition called prolonged QT that's a serious cause of fainting, um, but can also have epilepsy with it. Um, <clears throat> so these kinds of things can occur in a patient with a syndrome um, known to be associated with seizures. And you really need to take a good history to be sure that you're dealing with a seizure in order to be able to treat it correctly. Cause you never wanna be treating these things on this slide with anticonvulsants cause then you're exposing the patient to a medicine that um, isn't really doing anything. Um, so when we see, but when we do, or when we're convinced we have an initial seizure, we want to check things like blood work for glucose and sodium and potassium and calcium. If it's a partial seizure or focal seizure, for sure, we want to get an MRI scan. Um, we used to get um, CTs with infusion, but the MRI is just much more sensitive and better to get if you're dealing with a seizure problem. Um, if there's an acute fever or a mental status change, we might have to do a spinal tap. Um, and then we, all, we, we often want to do an EEG if there's been a seizure, but the EEG will not reflect what it normally is right after the seizure. So it's best to actually get the EEG about two weeks. If you have a big seizure, it's best to get the EEG about two weeks later, because then that tells you what your baseline EEG really looks like. Um, if a person is having slow development, then we may want additional genetic evaluations. And in fact, that may be how some patients are actually diagnosed with X, X and Y variations. Um, <clears throat> if you're already known to have a syndrome associated with seizures, um, then you may just have blood testing and the EEG and you may not have a big workup because people just know that it's due to your condition. Um, <clears throat> when should you go to the neurologist if you have a seizure? If there's a diagnostic dilemma, like we're really not sure this is a seizure, it could be something else, um, then the neurologist can help work that out. If you go on the medication and you're not responding easily to a, to a common medication for seizures, um, if the doctor is uncomfortable with seizure treatment, if the family is anxious and really wants to talk to a neurologist, um, or if it's a patient with a complex mix of problems like behavioral issues, intellectual problems, and seizures, that may best be um, evaluated through a specialized approach. Um, <clears throat> the EEG is important in seizure disorders. It helps us with diagnosing the epilepsy type. 
like is it generalized or focal? It helps us to determine if episodes are actually seizures, and it helps us identify certain specific epilepsy syndromes um, and to help guide a treatment decision. After a major seizure, there will be slowing and suppression of a seizure focus that might exist on the EEG. So again, if, if there's no acute reason to get the EEG, we really don't wanna get the EEG like a day or two after a seizure, it would be better to wait two weeks. Um, these are just some, some patients who are having a spells and we don't know whether they're seizures or not, but they're doing something weird and it's kind of stereotyped and people are worried about it. We may want to monitor them with these. These are all ambulatory EEG devices that you can wear in the house and wait for the patient to have a seizure or wait for the patient to have an episode of whatever it is they're doing. And then we can monitor and see if there's actually a seizure discharge in the brain that corresponds to the episode that we're trying to um, you know, determine whether it's a seizure or not. And this, these have these have become these have really revolutionized seizure diagnosis in child neurology because we use these a lot to figure out just to be sure we're treating the right thing and to understand what it is the patient's having. Um, so, what kinds of seizures do we see in X chromosome disorders? Um, X and Y variations. Well, we see pretty much the same seizures we see in the general population. It turns out there's not really one specific kind of seizures. The biggest study for um, mostly Kleinfelter, they, although they had a number of different variations, was at the University of Siena, where they saw 43 patients and then wrote a paper on it. And so they had 16 Turner patients, 17 Kleinfelter patients, seven XXX, and three other variations. Um, and in Kleinfelters, they had two out of the 17 who had seizures and they, they had part, those particular two had partial complex seizures and the EEG was abnormal in four out of the 17 patients. And remember the EEG can be abnormal and you can never have a, you might never have a seizure. So just having an abnormal EEG is not a reason to start someone on seizure medications. They didn't have any seizures in the Turner syndrome patients and in the XXX patients, they had five out of seven with partial complex seizures. And all five of those had an abnormal EEG with um, activity in the temporal parietal occipital, which is kind of on the side of the head um, in a characteristic kind of pattern. Um, and the seizures, were, the seizures were associated with subnormal IQs. Um, but in general, what they concluded was all the patients they saw with seizures and these X and Y variations were easy to control, and many of the patients grew out of their seizures. So the seizures were not an overriding big problem uh, in the long run but those with seizures were more likely to have lower intelligence. Um, then there was a Kleinfelter, there was a couple of other, there are two other studies. Um, five patients were published who were referred to an epilepsy clinic. And now that right there, those are the patients that had a spell that looked like it might be a seizure because they were referred to epilepsy clinic. So that doesn't mean that this study can tell you anything about the frequency of seizures in Kleinfelters. It can tell you something about the types of seizures in Kleinfelters. So this study showed that four of the patients did actually have seizures. Um, two had complex partial, one had a single generalized tonic clinic seizure, and one had a febrile seizure. Um, and and um, one had an abnormal EEG, but no seizures. And so this is just an example of the spectrum that we, uh, we don't have one particular thing that we're dealing with in these disorders. It could be any kind of seizure. Um, all had a good prognosis, just like the previous paper. Everybody grew out of their seizures. Um, and there was a certain kind of EEG finding in the back of the head in two of the patients. But this suggested a generally a good seizure outcome. And then there was another study again, looking at patients who were referred because somebody thought they had epilepsy, 12 patients, um, and they had nine uh, XXY, one XX, XXXY, and two mosaic patients. They saw multiple seizure, seizure types, both generalized tonic-clonic and partial seizures. One had febrile seizures, three had absence seizures, the staring episodes, one had atonic seizures, the sudden falling seizures, and five had several seizure types. So again, a, a mixed bag. Um, 10 had abnormal EEGs with spike wave or, or multifocal spike patterns, and many, many became seizure-free easily on anticonvulsants. So again, relatively good seizure prognosis for, um, for that study. Um, then um, <clears throat> Nicole Tartaglia published a paper on um, XXYY individuals in which 15% of 93 had non-febrile seizures at some time in life. Um, there was an XYY paper that showed 
of 55 patients diagnosed postnatally, meaning they came in with something and somebody sent a chromosome test, um, had seizures at some time in life, but only 3% of 35 that were diagnosed prenatally, suggesting that people who are diagnosed prenatally are um, because they're they're maybe not going to have symptoms that would lead them to diagnosis later on in life. Um, they're going to be less likely to have um, problems like seizures. Um, and then um, there's a big study by Wigby et al. and published in 2015 of XXX, which um, compared prenatal diagnosis to postnatal diagnosis of XXX. And 16.2% again of 74 patients had seizures. Um, whereas only 2.3% of 44 prenatal patients had seizures. So, well, well actually, so 16% overall, 2.3% of the 44 prenatal ones and 36.7% of the 30 postnatal patients. So again, if you come in with symptoms and are diagnosed because you have symptoms, that already weeds you out as a person who has more sort of brain symptoms of your sex chromosome aneuploidy, and so therefore you're more likely to have seizures. Whereas if it's just a prenatal diagnosis, then you have all the people that would have never been presented clinically and would probably not, and, and might not have even been diagnosed, um, who don't actually have learning problems or something else that would bring them into clinic. Um, so there were, again, both generalized and partial seizures, and there were some that had an abnormal EEG. Um, and so the findings are kind of, the consistency in these findings is that there's no consistent type of seizures that we see in um, patients with X and Y variations. And we need to just expect to teach, to um, treat the same types of seizures that we would generally see in the population. Um, so the treatment is gonna be basically the same for people with X and Y variations as it is for anyone else with seizures. And you can think of it as X and Y variations seem to lower the threshold to have a seizure in some percentage of the patients. And so the types of seizures that we see come through are the types of seizures that we see in the general population. It's just that you're more likely as a patient to have a seizure at some time than um, people in the general population would be. Um, so what do we do for seizures? Well, if there's an acute seizure, we don't panic. We roll the person on their side because we want them, if they're having secretion, um, in secretions, we want those to go out the side of their mouth and not to go back so they can aspirate. Um, we want to make sure they're breathing. We do not want to put anything in the mouth because they're not going to swallow their tongue and um, that could just be dangerous. We don't give people food or drink. We um, let them sleep after the event if needed, if the person is turning blue or if the respirations, if you can't tell whether they're breathing or not or if the seizure lasts more than 15 minutes, we usually say call the paramedics. Um, and then diastat is this um, quick acting rectal preparation that you can use to stop a seizure that we tell people to use if they have it. Um, and if it's the first seizure, usually we have people come in for testing for the underlying cause um, if it's right after the seizure. If the seizure passes and nothing happens for several weeks, then you would just do a clinic visit rather than going into emergency room. Um, and so this is just an example of don't give somebody having a seizure food or drink. Um, so status, so status epilepticus treatment is a seizure. That's then this is when you have that seizure that's going on for 30 minutes and it's not stopping and the patient is not alert and they're not responsive and you have to worry about whether they're breathing and how their blood flow is and everything. And so you manage them by making sure they're breathing um, by making sure that they don't have some acute problem like a low calcium or a low blood glucose. Um, you use this series of anticonvulsants um, like um, Valium or lorazepam or Dilantin or Phosphanitoin, Phenobarbital. You, you, typically, we give patients something in an IV to stop them from having a seizure. If they're really refractory, they may have a, um, a tube put in and, and have uh, go on the ventilator. Um, or are there these other rather extreme things that we can do to stop seizures that include things like propofol, which is, which is basically anesthesia? Um, when we're trying to decide, but most of the time we're not in that situation. We just have a patient that has a seizure and we need to decide, you know, should the patient go on medicine and what type of medicine should they go on? So the first thing is to kind of define the syndrome, uh, what type of seizure the patient have, and then select a medicine that's matched to the, to the, both the syndrome and maybe to the patient characteristics. If it's a medicine that aggravates behavior, you might not want to use it in a person that already has behavior problems. 
Um, so the basics, the basic principles of anticonvulsants in children are that we usually start after two or more seizures, because remember after that first one, there's only a 30 to 50% chance of a recurrent seizure. Um, and so we might go on medicine for something that's less likely than not to happen. So um, we often um, will wait until the second seizure, unless the first seizure is, a, is really a, a big one or um, something with concerning symptoms that we don't want to happen again. Um, we usually stop the medicine or wean it um, two to four years after the last seizure. Um, the single drug regimens are usually the best and we try to use the lowest effective dose. So even if a person is on a dose of anticonvulsant that's not therapeutic, if they aren't having any seizures, we might not necessarily raise that dose. The dosing guide is really effectiveness and toxicity. Blood levels are far less important and the EEG is an adjunct for deciding how well the drug is working and, uh, and how long you should keep the person on the drug. Um, more drug is not always more effective. Some of the seizure medicines have a really kind of an inverted curve where uh, each patient has sort of their own individual curve and you can go up to a certain point and get better control, but then if you go up higher, you may get worse control. Um, <clears throat> these are the anticonvulsants of the old days that we do not use as first line drugs anymore. Phenobarbital and Dilantin were basically all we had back in the 60s and 70s. Um, but, but Dilantin particularly has significant side effects and causes gum swelling and facial changes and acne. And after they published an article on identical twins, one of whom was treated with Dilantin during childhood and one of whom was not, and you could see just how um, really the Dilantin had destroyed the person's face and um, how much worse looking the patient on Dilantin was versus their identical twin. Um, really in pediatric neurology, we kind of stopped using this drug unless we absolutely have to. Um, carbamazepine, which is also Tegretol or Carbitrol, in the past was our first line anticonvulsant in most of the 80s, um, but other drugs um, came forward and replaced it because um, it can have issues where um, that we have to check blood constantly and um, monitor things. And then valproic acid or Depakine, Depakote. This is a drug we still use a lot. Um, in the past, it was the first line treatment for generalized seizures, and now we have other drugs. But for really serious, difficult to control seizures, particularly the atonic, myoclonic, some of the more difficult kinds of seizures to control, the Depakote can be quite powerful and can really help with seizure control. So um, we still use it, but not usually first line. Um, so these are the new anticonvulsants. We've really had quite a number of new anticonvulsants come out in the past 30 years. And um, those drugs are in general kind of less toxic than the earlier drugs. And so probably the most common drug to use right now is um, Keppra. And that would be the first line, Levetiracetam or Keppra. It's the first line for most seizure types. Um, and so we'll often start it. It's, it, it doesn't interact with any other drugs. It's very benign <clears throat> and it doesn't interact with any organ systems, but can aggravate behavior. And so if it's a behavioral patient, then that may not be the best choice. Oxcarbazepine or trileptal, which is very similar to Tegretol, but doesn't require blood work is, is probably often our second line choice. And then there's this big list of drugs that have certain properties. Um, which I'm going to show here, and are used for specific kinds of seizures. And so there's really no good reason for us to leave a patient on a drug that's causing a side effect at this point, because we have lots of choices, actually. And these, these choices uh, can have different side effects in different people, and often you can find a medication that doesn't have a lot of toxicity for a patient, unless they're just very, very intractable. Lamotrigine is, a, is another medication we use a lot because it's got very little in the way of cognitive side effects and it works pretty well for many patients. And you just have to go on it very slowly because it can cause a rash if you go on it too fast. Um, and then Epidiolex has had a lot of press recently. It's, this is the um, cannabidiol that is an actual an anti-epileptic, and this is pretty free of side effects too, and is actually approved right now only for Lennox Gastaut, so we can't really use it for patients with other kinds of seizures because insurance won't approve it, but there are more studies that are being done. And then if Keppra has side effects like behavioral side effects, there's a new thing called Brevaracetam, which um, has the same benign seizure profile as Keppra, but can, uh, you can get away without side effects. Um, the ketogenic diet is a calorie-restricted, high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet where 90% of your salaries, 
calories come from fat, it causes ketosis, and the ketosis causes seizure control. Um, it, it, it is associated with about a 20% good control rate for intractable patients, which is actually very high and, and probably better than anticonvulsants for intractable patients. It's often used when multiple anticonvulsants fail, when there are problems with anticonvulsant side effects, or when the family just wants to do something with diet rather than use an anticonvulsant. Um, but there's a lot of work that goes into doing this diet because you have to be very rigid about it. It works best when you can control the person's food intake. So in younger kids, in a motivated older child who really wants to do the, complete, the ketogenic diet or in an impaired over child, older child, for instance, where the parents control what they eat. Um, so again, yeah, the family has to be mo motivated and have kind of an organized lifestyle to run this diet. Um, it's best for atonic and absence for the drop seizures and the absence seizures, but can work for all types. This is the vagal nerve stimulator. This is the thing that gets implanted at the base of your neck on the vagal nerve. And you can set it to stimulate the nerve at a certain frequency and adjust the frequency. And in some cases it does uh, have a big rate of improve, a, a, a big improvement in control, but that's only about 10% of cases. It can work best for tonic seizures or when the patient has an aura. In other words, if they have, like when I have this smell, I know I'm gonna have my seizure. So when I have my smell, I activate the device and then it aborts the full seizures. And so it can be very effective in that setting. The risks are hoarseness after surgery because it's near the nerves that go to the voice box and uh, infection. And epilepsy surgery is an option for patients who have something other than an X and Y variation that's actually causing their seizures like, um, uh, or, or their seizures are coming from a very specific place in the brain that can be removed. Um, and this can sometimes be removed in a genetic disorder if the patient has a very specific focus where their seizures are coming from. Um, why do you have seizure recurrences after having control on medications? Um, one of the reasons is that you don't take your medicine. Um, another reason is not getting enough sleep or having an intercurrent, having an illness. And these are the most common reasons for having breakthrough seizures. Um, sometimes people feel like they're having more seizures when they're under stress. Um, this seems to be true for some types of seizures. And you can consider increasing, changing, or adding medication if there are breakthrough seizures. Um, there can be frequent occurrences with when you have recurrences with a prolonged seizure or just clusters where you don't want to raise the medicine every day, you can just use the rectal diastat and now the nasolam, which is the nasal um, preparation to stop a seizure um, at home and not have to go in for, for the emergency room or anything. Um, and when we're taking care of people with seizures, we need to be thinking about the seizure control, but also the side effects of the medication and whether those are impacting the person's life, psychosocial impacts of having seizures, um, educational impacts of having seizures or of having whatever is going along with the seizures. If a patient has a genetic condition that's gonna cause some learning problems as well as seizures, we wanna be addressing the whole person and the learning problems in addition to the seizures and behavior because behavior can interact with seizures and anticonvulsant medications. And sometimes people are on behavior behavior medications, and we have to make sure that the medicines are mixing okay. Um, and then in adults, um, whether the seizures can be impacting um, full independence. And so these are all pieces that we do when we're um, thinking about seizure control. Um, when can you stop medicines? We think about stopping medicines after two years seizure-free, especially if the EEG is normal. We may treat longer if the patient was really hard to get under control or if they have an underlying condition that we know is associated with big seizure risk. Um, if a person's on multiple medicines, we may wean one after a year or two seizure-free. And there's always some risk of recurrence no matter when we um, wean the medications, but we can always restart the medications if there's a recurrence. Okay, I'm gonna stop here because it's, um, there's about 15 minutes left and um, I was wanted to leave time to answer questions. Um, so I think we'll just focus on seizures if that's what everybody wants to do and answer questions.